They seem very big. OK, uh, let's get started because we have a lot of things to get through. Um, I am going to talk at you for the next 35 to 40 minutes about exceptions. Um, a couple of orders of business. I realize the screen is quite low, and there are some code samples later. If you guys at the back want to follow on, the slides are online. Uh, bit.ly forward slash ed dash loves dash exceptions. So if you want to follow along at the back and you can't quite see, and you have some kind of internet connected device, uh, maybe try that. And secondly, I was kind of pleased at my mildly amusing title, but with hindsight, it doesn't really explain what this talk is about, other than it's slightly about exceptions. So this isn't really an introduction to exceptions. We're not really going to go over the syntax or any kind of drier details. We're going to be looking at how and why, kind of a slightly more higher level. Um, so let's crack on, because we have a lot to get through. Um, who the hell is this? My name is Ed Van Bainham. Hello. You look lovely today, except you. Um, been in PHP for about six years, um, independent contractor now, previously at iBuildings, who are hiring. They're a good bunch of geeks. Go and talk to them in the main foyer. Um, there's a picture of my face. I don't know why I did that, because you get the live show. You lucky people. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Do not follow me. Do not read my blog. Do not read, rate this talk and those slides are on slide deck if you want to follow along. So first up, I want to ask, answer the question that you all have at the moment. Why would anyone do a talk about exceptions? This sounds like the most boring thing in the world. And the old me, the old me of six months ago, probably would have agreed. Well, he probably didn't even have an opinion. He kind of understood the syntax of throwing and catching, but he didn't really have any kind of uh, coherent strategy for dealing with exceptions. He would kind of gloss over them and kind of hope he didn't have to deal with them. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how this talk came about. I felt like I kind of sucked at exceptions, and from chatting to some of my friends of mine, there I heard similar things. They were going, you know, no one's really been able to explain exceptions to me. So this is my attempt to try and explain exceptions. And during the course of the last six months, I've realized they're actually really interesting. Now, I appreciate that you probably don't believe me at this point, but I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes, 35 minutes, trying to convince you otherwise. So the old me had five questions that he would want answering. The old me would ask, what the hell is an exception, really? Strip away everything that I think that I know, or the kind of things you hear people saying about them, where do they come from? What is the problem that they're solving? What are they? We'll look at that. When should I throw an exception? This is the, the big question. And I can give you a little spoiler now. The answer is, it depends. But we will look at what it depends on and some of the questions you want to ask yourself just before you type throw new. Is there any PHP-specific craziness that you need to know about? We all know and love PHP for all its quirks. So as it turns out, there is a little bit, but there's quite a lot, really. Um, so we're going to look at that. That was actually the hardest section of the talk to write. Well, it was the easiest, but the talk turned into like a two and a half hour lecture. When, well, why don't some people like exceptions and what are the alternatives? This certainly isn't a pro exceptions talk. Um, yeah, we'll look at what the alternatives are and you know, what circumstances might you might not want to throw them. And finally, with all our newfound exception skills, um, what are the best practices? So what the hell is an exception really? Well, to answer this, we'll go back in time. Uh, back before even PHP was a uh, twinkle in Rasmus's eye. And all code was procedural. It was a list of functions that got executed. Uh, computer did that. Boom, that's your program. Programmers found that they were repeating bits of code, and the idea of functions came along. So they would put reusable bits of code that they could pass messages, would execute, and then return a value. And all was well. That is, until something went wrong in that function. Now, all of a sudden, that function needs to be able to tell the calling code that something has gone wrong. 
So in our procedural world, there are kind of three main ways that they do that. Um, firstly is an output parameter. Don't really see this much in PHP. Um, but here, the idea is that you pass in a parameter to the function you're calling, usually by reference. The function then can perform some operation on that, and then the calling code can inspect it to make sure that the function executed correctly. They can use global, global error variables. Um, this does happen a little bit in PHP, happening a lot less, uh, which is good, but things like uh, the MySQL error function, for example, that will return the global error variable. Or you can return a value. The function is going to return a value anyway. Let's just return one, but somehow flag it as an error. And that's where a problem arises, because, of course, how do you actually tell the difference between what's a normal return value and what's an error value? If you're lucky enough to be working with a function that returns positive integers, then potentially returning a negative integer would be one answer to that. But it's not great, and then if you have to deal with a function that could return any kind of integers, then you've got a problem. It is also compounded by the fact, or if you're working with a PHP, if you're working with a programming language, excuse me, that has a we have to declare the return type of a function, then you're obviously limited to one type. So PHP gets around this by being able to return whatever the hell it wants from functions whenever it wants. So it can return false instead of, uh, instead of uh, integer value. So think of like string position. Uh, if it can't find the string you're looking for, it returns false. But this is called basically the semi-predicate problem, which is just a fancy name for what I just described. So you can Tell your friends about that and impress them later in the pub. There are other problems as well. There is, there's no stack traces or messages or context. You can't give any more useful information. All you know is that the error has occurred. You, don't, you can't really tell it why or when or where. Dealing with multiple functions and having to have a big nested array of if-elses soon becomes messy. Um, and also kind of violates command query separation, which sounds very grand. Uh, command query separation is just really the idea that uh, functions are split into two types. A command, which operates on the object, changes the object state in some way, but doesn't return a value. Or a function is a query, which just returns data from the object, but doesn't affect its state. If you need to check that a command function has executed correctly, then all of a sudden it needs to be able to return a value so that breaks this idea of the separation. So there are the problems. And that is what exceptions solve. They are, there's no need now for return value. Exceptions are just like a side channel. So the uh, function can have this new communication channel to tell the calling code that something's gone wrong. Um, you can add extra data. You know, the exceptions are just objects. So you can add stack traces, uh, messages, whatever you want. And also, there's a kind of a clear separation uh, when you're looking at the code between like, the try and catch. You can see the happy path in the try and then the failure handling in the catch. So really, that's all they are. They're an alternative channel for um, a function to be able to communicate back with its parent to say, parent, that's not a good word to use, with its calling code uh, to be notified that something's gone wrong. So let's have a little presentation cliche here and have a quote from someone far smarter than me to make me look like I've done some reading. Um, Steve McConnell says, exceptions are specific means by which code can pass along errors or exceptional events to the code that called it. Now, the old me read that and went, meh, what? Uh, <laughs> I think really it's this word, or the words specific means. That doesn't really kind of help clarify what, 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 it, what they're talking about. So using our newfound knowledge, we can put in an alternative channel. Now, suddenly, that makes a bit more sense. I can go, yeah, OK. And that is all an exception is. The new me would hear this. The old me would hear this quite a lot. Exceptions are for unexpected events. That's in the pragmatic programmer. That would really confuse the old me. The old me would read that and go, exceptions are for uh, inconceivable events. And I would be confused because I would go, well, I'm writing this code for something I cannot conceive of. How can I possibly write code? Surely the act of writing code 
means that I can conceive of it. How am I ever going to write an exception handler? Like, I, just, I did not understand. For example, zombies erupting from the sidewalk. But it turns out that's not what exceptions are for. And when I found that out, I had to remove all the zombie attack handling code from my application. What it really means is if I can try and give a definition of what they're trying to say is exceptions are for incorrect circumstances. So you don't need to, they're not there to deal with every single possible crazy eventuality. Um, if we take our little sidewalk metaphor a bit further, we can say that you know, a sidewalk, it's conceivable, and we can appreciate that someone might be using it incorrectly, for say cycling on it. In that case, exceptions are a good idea. If a zombie attack happens, there's not much we can do. We've got bigger problems. So that's really all exceptions are. Um, to an alternative channel by which calling code can notify its caller that something's gone wrong, and therefore in correct circumstances. When should I throw an exception? Now this, as I've already spoiled the answer, the answer is it depends. But what does it depend on? Uh, there is quite a few things we can look at, and I can't give you a concrete answer, but some of the things you want to think about, we shall look at now. Robustness versus correctness. Well, this is the idea that your application, well, your application should be robust and correct, obviously, in a perfect world, but when an error does occur, is it better that it's robust or is it better that it's correct? So try and analyze which of those two camps your application falls into. If it needs to be correct, then it needs to only deal with correct data. As soon as, da as data isn't right in any way, you probably want to be throwing an exception or at least notifying someone that something's gone wrong and hoping that they can deal with it. However, if it's better that your application carries on functioning, then you need robustness. You want to carry on. Um, in that case, exceptions perhaps aren't such a good idea. Um, we will look at some of the alternatives a little later. But try and think about robustness or correctness in your application when trying to decide if you want to be throwing an exception. When should you throw an exception? If you don't have enough context in which to fix it. This is the idea that your program, what does your program know when you're about to throw an exception? We'll have a quick look at uh, the Zend REST client from the Zend framework. I think this is 1.11. Um, this is just a set URI function that uh, sets a URI, would you believe? And it passes in a, a, a parameter called URI. Now, in this case, this function really expects an instance of Zend URI HTTP, and then it sets that as a class variable. If we don't get an instance of that, we could have thrown an exception. But in this case, the code has enough context to try and fix it. In this case, the code knows that there is a Zend URI factory. Whether Zend REST client should know that there's a Zend URI factory is a whole other matter, but it knows that there is, and it can go do you know what? Perhaps the URI factory can create the object we want. So in this case, we aren't throwing exception because we can try and fix the error. A little later, uh, in the same, same REST client, we see there's a prepare REST function. This just does a bit of setup before a REST call is made. In this context, however, if we don't have that same URI class variable, in this context, the code can't second guess what to do. It can't try and, you know, uh, try and fix the error somehow. In this case, all it can do is throw an exception and go, hey, you know what? I hope someone else can fix this because I can't carry on. The other thing to think about when you're thinking about context and when to throw an exception, are you passing an error down the call chain? Because with exceptions, you want to be throwing them as close to the occurrence of the, of the exception as possible. To try and illustrate that, we can look at that set URI function we saw a couple of slides ago. In this case, it could be argued that we are actually passing an error down the call chain. What if someone tries to pass in an integer into set URI? Well, in this case, we actually pass it down to Zend URI factory. 
And it could be argued that really, we, ha we know that it's unlikely, well, it's almost impossible. You can't turn an integer into a URI. So really, we're actually passing this error down. And the Zend URI factory will throw an exception saying, this is not the correct data I was expecting, whereas actually it happened earlier up the call chain. So we're losing some of the context. Um, that's <laughs> that was smooth, right? <laughs> so really, you could be argued that actually, if you put in an extra else, else clause to check that it's not numeric, then you pass it down to Zend UI factory. And then finally, you would throw the exception. <laughs> Rather, if it's not a string or an instance of Zend URI, then you throw an exception. So think about, are you throwing an error further down uh, the call chain than is really necessary? When should you throw an exception? Well, you probably shouldn't for just for flow control. Um, look at another quote from the pragmatic programmers. Ask yourself, will this code still run if I remove the exception handling? If the answer is no, then you're probably using it for flow control. Um, it's a little bit of toy code here. We're getting a user, and we're using the user not logged in exception just for flow control. We're not really doing anything about it, or we're not really trying to fix the exception. It's just for controlling how the program executes. So you don't really want to be using exceptions for that. When else should you throw an exception? Am I prepared to end the program? Of D. Grimm is a Ruby, Ruby guy, and he wrote a book called Exceptional Ruby, which is an awesome book. Even if you aren't a Ruby developer, it covers a lot of more conceptual ideas about exceptions and failure handling. And in fact, quite a lot of it has inspired this talk. It's like 15 bucks as an ebook. I highly recommend you go and get it. Um, one of the most, most useful things I took from that book was this, was this question. Am I prepared to end the program? Because uncalled exceptions will terminate your program. So this is just a really simple thing you can ask yourself, just as you're about to type throw new. You go, do you know what? Am I actually ready to, to terminate? Am I really ready to type die? Or is there something else I can do? That I found very useful. What else should you throw an exception? Well, think about the way your code is going to be used. If you're writing a standalone application, then you're probably free to throw and catch exceptions as you wish. If you're writing a library, then at some point, hopefully, if other people use it, then your code is going to be part of someone else's application. And you don't really want to impose what your idea of exceptional is onto someone else's code. Um, if you're throwing exceptions, potentially terminating their program, they aren't going to be too happy with you. So you really want your code to be a good citizen. So in that case, your public API, or the library's API that you're using, you probably don't want to be throwing exceptions in that case. And we will look at, as I've said, some alternatives to that. So really, there, those are some of those questions that you want to ask yourself when deciding when do I want to throw an exception. Is there any PHP-specific craziness that I should know about? Yes. Yes, there is. Um, PHP is quirky, which <laughs> why we all love it. It has have exceptions, and it does have uh, return, return codes. It has something else. It has errors. I'm sure we've all come across them um, in our day-to-day -day, uh, business. Now, errors aren't exceptions, because they can't be caught. And they're not return values, because we can't inspect them as programmers. Or they're not available for us for inspection by default without some jiggery pokery. So they, so PHP has these three, three ideas. But wait, there's more. There's a fourth one. If there is a problem with a post upload and a file, then it won't throw an exception, it won't return false, and it won't trigger an error. It'll stick a little message in the file super global. So there you go. Four, four places to look in PHP when you want to find out about failure handling. How did this happen? Well, I think it's just one area that really shows PHP's kind of accreted history. We've kind of got uh, the procedural C history with 
uh, return values and error codes and the like. And then we've kind of got this wannabe Java OO stuff kind of bolted on. Um, and we've got exceptions kind of there too. I think errors are just a kind of a, we're kind of put in there just to try and, because people got kind of fed up with just dealing with return codes and uh, global error values. But they needed something else, but it, PHP wasn't object oriented in those days. So they probably put, ex they put, put errors in for that. So really, my rule of thumb when trying to navigate my way through these choppy waters, exceptions. They are thrown by us, the programmer. We are free to throw, throw exceptions whenever we wish. They are also thrown by the newer PHP components. So things like uh, PDO, DateTime, SQLite. If you try and create a new DateTime object with uh, you know, a garbage string as the, uh, as the parameter, then it will trigger an exception. Errors are triggered by the older procedural uh, PHP 4 kind of core functions, or 4 and earlier. And return codes are uh, return values from these core functions, but for unexceptional circumstances. So we're looking at string position, say, if you don't pass it any, any parameters at all, then it will trigger an error. If you pass it the correct, the correct values, but the string isn't found, then it returns false. I said earlier that errors aren't available to us without some jiggery pokery. This is the jiggery pokery. Um, there are quite a lot of error handling functions in PHP's core, but really the two you want to know about, set error handler, restore error handler. Set error handler allows you to pass in a string, which is the name of a function that then gets called whenever a PHP error is detected. There's a few pitfalls with that, like it for example, it will throw an error, sorry, it gets uh, triggered regardless of what your error reporting is. So you need to kind of build in checking what the error reporting is into your set error handler function. So yeah, it's a bit crazy. Um, restore error handler just puts PHP's default error handler back. Really my advice is if you can, leave them the hell alone. But unfortunately, PHP forces our hand sometimes. Um, for example, the core kind of parse file, uh, parse functions, so like parse XML, parse INI, they trigger exceptions if the file is not found or if it's malformed. And really, more often than not, as programmers, we want to know that that's happened. We don't want just a, an error to be triggered in and written to the to the log, and then the program to carry on carry on working. So we need to be able to try and inspect the return value. So really, what we want to do, we want to call parse any file, pass in the file name, get the re resulting array. This is what we have to do. This is what Zen Framework does. We have to, this is a daunting slide of code. Um, we set our own error handler. Really, this is massively simplified, but we just grab the error string and set that as a class, class variable. We then have a little wrapper function around our parse any file. We set our own error handler to go use that little chap there. We call the function that we actually want to execute. We then restore the error handler back to PHP's default. Then we have an error string. So we know if something has gone wrong with the parse any file, we will have set the class variable. And then we can throw an exception. PHP just does this. This is something we're going to have to, we have to get used to and just deal with. So this is how Zen Framework does it. If you have to do the same thing, perhaps steal, steal from there. There's a few other little fun bits of PHP, die and exit. These seem very popular if you're writing a tutorial on the database about connecting. If you're writing a tutorial on the database? If you're writing a tutorial on the internet about connecting to the database. Then you seemingly have to use die when uh, trying to make a connection. Please stop doing this. That's a plea to the internet as a whole, not, not to you people here. Uh, I'm sure you would never do such a thing. But there's no context. There's no error logging. You don't know where that uh, die or exit statement is. It terminates immediately. Better to use exceptions. This brings me to the error suppression operator. <laughs> This, this came around 
well, this is used often, like, for example, in that Zend uh, pars INI example. What we could have done, we could have suppressed the errors. Instead of going through all that crazy setup of our own error handler, calling it, setting a string, and throwing a reception, what you can, you can do is just merely suppress the call with the suppression operator, and then deal with, and then it, hope that it returns false. The main problem with this is that if there is, well, actually, let's take a step back first and see what it actually does. What it does, it sets error reporting to zero, executes the suppressed function, and then re reverts error handling back to its previous setting. Not too, not too bad, you, not too bad, you might think. But if a fatal error occurs during that suppressed function, then your program terminates with no indication why. Imagine that, a white screen of death, there's no log, there's no errors, there's nothing. Imagine trying to debug that. So for the love of God, please do not use the suppression operator at all. You can possibly justify using it with the PHP core functions, but if you're writing your own function, please, please try and stop doing that. Finally, on this kind of giddy whirlwind tour of uh, failure handling in PHP, we have SPL exceptions. Now these were put in at PHP 5.3, and they're great. They give us the ability to add semantic meaning to exceptions. Previously, we'd have to throw an exception, and really the only way we could work out what was wrong was by inspecting the error message and hoping that someone had put a useful error message in there. SPL exceptions allow us to add semantic meaning. Um, problem is, the documentation on the official PHP.net site isn't great, and they're not completely self-evident just from inspecting them what they should be doing. Really, there's, they both extend the exception class, and they're split into two. Uh, they're split into runtime exceptions and logic exceptions. These bad function and method calls, we can kind of disregard. They're there for um, the magic double underscore call operator um, method, sorry. So if you're, if you're using that, then maybe those exceptions are useful. Otherwise, you can skip that. Um, these logic exceptions I mean a domain exception. I haven't found a great uh, explanation of what that's actually for. Something's gone wrong with the domain logic in your, in your application. But, you know, invalid argument exception, that's quite useful. So we were kind of talking about the command query separation. And I really, really wanted these two to be split to command and query, because that would just tie up the whole thing really nicely. But alas, it was not to be. Um, it's, you could kind of say that um, the logic kind of ties in with the query, and then the runtime is the command, but it doesn't quite work. So these are good. They, as I've said, semantic meaning. But really, we're going to look later in the best practices that actually you want to be subclassing these. You don't want to be using these on their own. So that has been kind of a quickly, quickly through some of the craziness in PHP. Um, there is quite a lot more reading on the further reading slide at the end. So if you kind of want to get more deep into what's going on, um, there's some good resources there. So what are the alternatives to exceptions and why don't some people like them? This guy, he hates exceptions. He's going to hit them with a big bat. Potential problems. They are invisible in the source code. They're kind of difficult to see what's going to throw an exception. Um, in Java, we do have like throws keywords, so we can at least see what kind of function, see what kind of exceptions a function is going to call. But we don't have that in PHP. We're either going to have to rely on the throws dot block annotation and hope that our developer friend has maintained it and is correct, or you're just going to have to look at it. It does add exceptions, do add some more paths through the function. More complexity does add more bugs, it can be argued. Uh, the prags, so <laughs> the prags, like I know them, yeah. Uh, the prags, an exception represents an immediate non-local transfer of control. It's kind of a cascading go-to. Let's just be glad no one's added go-to to PHP, because that would be a very bad idea. <laughs> why, so why not use exceptions? They are tightly coupled to the code that uses them. As anyone who has tried to use a Zend component on, on its own quickly finds out, you need the Zend exception. 
So there's like a hard dependency there between the exception classes and the calling classes. Exceptions can be argued also weaken encapsulation. They can expose more data about, well, expose more kind of implementation details about a function than is really necessary. Um, you know, you want to try and hide as much of the implementation data details as you can. Um, that's not necessarily to stop people knowing how your class works, but to stop them relying on knowing how the class works. So we'll look a little later at an example where we do expose some of these details, and we'll look at how we can fix that. So what are the alternatives? Well, if you're going down the robustness route, then you can return good enough data. You can look at the closest legal value, return the next or previous valid bit of data, or use a neutral value. Talking about neutral values, just want to quickly touch on the null object pattern, which can be useful in this situation. Our little novelty application here is a zombie, zombie tracking app. We want to keep a record of all the members of our party who have been infected. So we've got a little form for that. Instead of having a form for updating and inserting, we can use the same form. Quite often, you would see someone check for, is, if zombie is null, then echo zombie get name. But with a null object, our ORM will return a valid zombie object, but all of its methods will just return null. So we can just drop it into our code, kind of like it's chemically inert. So you can drop it into the code, nothing will happen, but it gives you, um, it kind of removes the responsibility for checking for null from the client code. Um, but null object, not the greatest name. Potentially default objects would be better. But yes, if you're looking at returning a neutral value, that might be a way to go. The no raise API, we were talking about libraries um, earlier and saying that you probably don't want to be throwing exceptions from their API. Well, you can implement the idea of a no raise API, which kind of ties in with some more smart people, uh, Kernan and Pike in the practice of programming. In most cases, the caller should determine how to handle an error, not the callee. PHP's curl library does this. I mean, it could be argued that it wasn't intentional because it was written before we had exceptions in PHP, but we'll set that aside. This is actually an example of a no raise API. So we do our curl initialization, and we set our URL, and we execute it. Whatever the result of this execution, there's no exceptions, there's no errors triggered. Um, I think in the worst case, it may return false. But all curl does, it just logs the errors. It logs, excuse me, it logs the, uh, the results and all the data it has into, well, this kind of crazy system where we've got to pass in constants to get it out. But that crazy system aside, it just stores the data. Then it's up to us as the client to inspect that data, and then we can decide whether there's an exception or not, or whether we consider the result to be exceptional. For example, in this case, if it returns my favorite HTTP code, then we say, do you know what? That's exceptional. We'll throw an exception then. So really, you're delegating the responsibility for deciding what's exceptional or not to the client. So think about that if you're writing a library. Um, can you delegate? Defensive programming. Now, I kind of didn't, well, I wasn't quite sure whether to put this slide in or not, but I have this little Lego man, and I thought, yeah, I'll put it in. So really, this is like a, it's not really an alternative to exceptions, but it's more it's like a blanket term for various practices that try and mitigate errors and problems in your production code, um, but trying to keep it kind of stable. Um, you kind of the idea that you're the best programmer ever, everyone else is going to use your stuff wrong. So expect your functions to be used erroneously. Um, and then you try and compensate for that or silently fail. I mean, you'll see this often after a function declaration, you then have a bunch of if-elses. So that's the, the idea behind offensive programming. The program, programming language Eiffel takes that a step further to design by contract. The whole problem with like, looking at these alternatives is what is incorrect. If you're looking at a no-raise API, that delegates the decision uh, to, the, to the client. So really, the idea behind design by contract is that it actually tries to define upfront what is the correct circumstance. Design by contract is probably a whole talk on its own, 
But for now, we'll just say it's got preconditions and postconditions. And a function goes, basically, if you give me these preconditions, then I will guarantee these postconditions. It's quite an interesting idea. Um, I realize we aren't at Eiffel UK. This is PHP UK. PHP does have the assert function. So if you want to look at some of the um, sort of play around with the idea of design by contract, we have an assert function. It's actually there since PHP 4, which I did not realize. But we have an assert function. And basically, it just evals this string. Hurrah, eval. Um, so if it returns, if it evals to true, then the uh, function continues. But if it evals to false, well, this is a limitation of the library. It then uses errors. Yuck. I would suggest if you want to look more at design by contract, uh, Stuart Herbert has written contracts lib. Um, this is an improvement. It doesn't have eval strings, and it throws exceptions. Uh, that's the link. GitHub, <laughs> check it out. That is quite interesting. So really, that's just a brief tour of what's, uh, what's kind of wrong with exceptions and what some alternatives are. What are the best practices when using exceptions? We now have some awesome exception skills, or at least we have some things we can use to discuss exceptions with in a vaguely sensible way. What are the kind of best practices you want to be using? Don't have empty catch blocks. Um, this really just shows there's, there's an error either, or there's a problem in the try block, and that is, why is it throwing an exception for an unexceptional circumstance? Or there's a problem in the catch block. You know, why doesn't it want to do anything with the error? Why doesn't it even log? So determine the root cause of that and fix either the try or the catch block. And if you really must have an empty catch block, please leave us a comment. So when we come along later, we can try and figure out why it's just an empty catch. Subclassing exceptions. We were looking earlier at the SPL exceptions. What's the point? We have to add extra classes to our code, got more files. It's just, yeah, what's the point? Well, it does add context. Um, you can now catch an exception based on its exceptionness rather than just looking at, at the message. Um, you aren't solely reliant on the exception's message to provide information. You can look at the type of error. So, oh, that's an invalid argument exception. That's only quite clear. Um, also think about people whose language isn't English, as their whose first language isn't English. <laughs> Respect mine to be, but it clearly isn't just there. Um, you know, they get an exception message. If it's just base class exception, they might go, I really don't understand what this message means. If it's subclasses as an exception, they at least have an idea that it's either an invalid parameter or something like that. Um, and it avoids namespace clashes as well um, with the base exception class. So the idea um, behind that is that if two libraries are both, thro are both throwing the base exception class, then as a calling code, we have no way of determining who threw what. So we've got a smelling factory, a smelling library that detects brains, walking library goes forward. We now don't know who's done what if, if an exception has been thrown. So if you've got subclasses, now our uh, calling code can react appropriately depending on which library through which. So if we can't detect any brains, let's try a new direction. If we can't move forward, we'll just groan, press up against the glass and wait. So think about, um, yeah, so subclass or exceptions and also, OK, this is more for comedy rather than usefulness, but think about ex uh, extending the SPL exceptions as well to give more context about what the exception is. We said earlier that exceptions can weaken encapsulation. Um, think about what details you are exposing by throwing exceptions. Um, it is quite easy to, to expose these details. Let's have a look at here. Our, our human, get brains. looking at this code, we can see quite obviously that our human is using a file system to store its brains. Suddenly, from head office, we get a call. Humans must store their brains in a database. For God's sake, what are you doing? Suddenly, GetBrains now throws a database not found exception. So we, are, so we now need to go and change all the, all the, the calls to GetBrains 
to now catch a database exception instead. Really, what we should have done is thrown an exception at the correct abstraction layer or level. Uh, so getBrains should have thrown a brains not found exception. That doesn't expose how it stores brains. And then our client code can remain unchanged regardless of, uh, regardless of what our implementation is. So really, that's just a few quick things um, that you want to think about. Finally, you didn't think you could get through a talk on exceptions without some terrible exception puns. So we're now at the new me. And the new me doesn't know it all by any stretch of the imagination. But the new me now has quite a good idea about at least being able to talk about exceptions in a vaguely coherent way, at least have discussions with other members of my team. Um, so that's kind of where I am now. And we'll do a quick recap exceptions. Alternative communication channel for incorrect circumstances. That's all they are. The new me would say, before throwing them, we have looked at some of the questions you want to ask. But really, the most useful one I found is, are you prepared to end the program? Um, the new me cannot sum up PHP's failure handling in a single bullet point. But the new me would say, think about the alternatives. Um, the no base API, um, try and delegate the decision if you can. And we've looked at some best practices, subclass those exceptions, and watch out for exposing implementation details. Which brings us to the end. So unless I've missed anything, or how are we doing for time? We've got a few minutes for questions. Um, is there anything I've kind of missed? Anything no one's kind of glossed over? That's also, oh, there are some hands. I really can't see from up here. Um, yes, do you have microphones and things like that? There is. We have technology. Oh, we'll go over here. Right. We'll come back to you, I promise. Okay. Yes? Okay, uh, two things uh, to ask. Yes. Um, firstly, can you elaborate on precisely why it's a bad idea to use exceptions for flow control? For instance, I was working on some code that uses yeah. it to validate user input, which I know looks like a maybe bad idea, but I mean, can you, actually can you say precisely why? Yeah. The other one is, what do you do if you've got a um, impossible in, uh, an exception situation in yeah. the in the main method, so you can't it couldn't be caught if you threw it. What would you do there? Okay. Um, the first question is why wouldn't you use it for flow control? That's a good question. I mean, it does provide you know control structures. You can now jump to different places in the code, but they are kind of go-to's as kind of the pragmatic program has alluded to, and really it just makes me a little bit like, oh, that's not quite right. Like, it does work, but it's not quite right. It's like someone using kind of inheritance over composition or something. You kind of go, yeah, it kind of works, but it's just not quite right. Um, but yes, yeah, someone was talking to me about a Java library that actually uses exceptions for flow control to achieve some, um, some certain things that you can't do without exceptions. Not sure I mentioned that, because I really don't know any more than that. But there does seem to be examples uh, of using exceptions. Uh, as for your other uh, using exceptions for flow control, um, as for the other question, I didn't quite get. What do you do if you need to throw an error yeah. um, outside of a function? Because it can't be caught. Uh, yeah, so if we've got a proceed. Well, you mean you still can throw an exception doesn't necessarily need to be in a function. Is that what you should advise doing in that situation? Yes, as long as it makes sense. And yeah, yeah, I think I probably would do that. OK, thank you. Uh, we had a Anyone question else? over here. Yes. Um, about the don't throw an exception. Is this on? Yeah. Is yeah. Um, about the don't throw an exception um, unless you're willing to end the program. Yeah. Um, most of the time, you're going to be writing, you're probably going to be wanting to throw exceptions within models, which are probably going to be reused by somebody that's not you. Um, and mm. it doesn't make sense to throw an exception to indicate the way that your model should be being used. If someone's clearly like misunderstood the way that your method, or you think that because of the, what you've been passed through, someone's misunderstood the way your method should be used, is that a legitimate reason to throw an exception? Because that yeah. would end the program where maybe they wouldn't want that, but you're deliberately ending the program to say to them, you've done Go something look wrong. Look at this, you've done something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, that kind of brings up the question is like, who are exceptions for? Are they for other developers? Are they for you? 
like for the end user. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> um, the new me is still learning. Uh, but yes, if you really want to enforce, you know, this is how you use this model, then yes, by, yeah, certainly throwing exception would then force people to use it that way. Right. Yeah. So I think that's probably the way I normally use exceptions, is normally yeah. for that reason. Yeah, yes, keep, keep people in line. Yeah. Yes, that's a good, <laughs> good plan. Um, how are we doing for time? I'm kind of aware that we've got... Yeah, I think everyone needs to get to the auditorium. We do need so. to get to the auditorium. If there's more questions, um, I'm around for tonight and tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>